So hey, we're gonna do um we're gonna do a little bit of a bump a bumper here. Okay. And um can you just for um for our, our <laughs> for me to make sure that we pronounce your name right, could you pronounce it for us? Uh, Dan Koritz. Koritz. Okay. Yep. Thank you. We're gonna talk testing. Is it really having the impact we want it to in the US? That's right, Scott. Today we have Dan Koritz with us. Uh, he's a Harvard professor, and he's written a book called The Testing Charade, Pretending to Make Schools Better. Wow, that is right up our alley, isn't it, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic book, Tim. I mean, it's, and um, um, Dr. Koritz, why don't you just share a little bit about what the book's about to get us going here? Okay, well, the origin of the book was a visit by an editor I didn't know from the University of Chicago Press who said that she thought I'd been pulling my punches and writing about high stakes testing. She said, I, I figured out that your opinions are a lot stronger than what you've written. <laughs> and that was, of course, true because I'm an academic. I have to write in measured tones and so on. But the fact is, um, I've been get, growing increasingly impatient because the data showing that high stakes testing hasn't done what we want has been accumulating for a long time, literally almost 30 years. And a lot of people were pretending that wasn't true. They were just ignoring that and, and saying either we need to keep doing this or we're succeeding in doing it when in fact we failed. And that's the origin of the title. I wanted to do something to make it harder to pretend that high stakes testing was working. It, so let's, let's define that because I know you do a, a great job like differentiating in the book between what type of testing you're talking about. You're not talking about all type of testing. You're just talking about the type of testing that's really more like a poll in a sense. I think you describe it as, as like polling information from students rather than actually getting data that will help us as teachers. Well, let's separate two, two things. One is the type of test and the bigger one is how the test is used. Most of the tests that we're concerned about are like polls. You know, if you sit a kid down at the end of the year to find out what he or she has learned during eighth grade and mathematics or anything else, you have a limited amount of time, maybe, let's say, 90 minutes, depending on your state. So you ask them a small number of questions. And based on that small number of questions, you try to, to figure out, try to estimate what they've learned all year. And that works fine if you have a well-designed test and you don't put pressure on people just to raise scores. Where it breaks down is if you tell people that the scores themselves are what matter. And therefore, if, well, I'll give, use the example of Massachusetts, which requires passing a math test to graduate from high school. Uh, for years, the number of items that counted toward that was 42. So 10 years of work was represented by 42 questions. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, you don't want to say all we need to do in 10 years is teach kids to answer 42 questions, right? But that's what's happened. People have been forced to focus on the particular test they're held accountable for, and they've narrowed and narrowed the curriculum to focus more and more on that test. And in some cases, they've really cut corners. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, you know, just both Tim and I being educators, I think we feel the pressure, even though we know that those high stakes testing is really not beneficial for anyone or any, especially the kids, it doesn't give the parents correct and valid information and um, to how their students actually doing. So it's like, but but we constantly feel that pressure um, because they publish the scores in the newspaper because right. you know the the district wants to look good. They want to they want to sh we we all want to show that we're doing a good job at what we're doing, and so we we look for these measures. Um, what else is going wrong with the testing? Well, it's really the pressure. Uh, you know, it, testing, if it's done well, is really enormously useful. And one of the things I try to clarify in this book is it's not an anti-testing book. So in my kind of work, for example, it's really critical that we be able to answer questions like, uh, are kids with disabilities catching up with other kids? Or are English language learners catching up? And the only way to do that is with standardized tests. I mean, that's how we know, for example, uh, to give you two examples that are a big deal in my classes, we know that for decades, the gap between African-American kids and white kids has been gradually narrowing. But at the same time, the gap between rich and poor kids has been growing. Mm. How do we know that? We know that was because of standardized tests. It's the only way we know it. The problem is that uh, 
teachers have been forced to focus on scores rather than on the quality of teaching. Uh, a lot of the policymakers act as though those are the same things, but they're not. Uh, that's why in the book, I give the example of Norca Padilla. Uh, I asked her permission to cite her by name, who is one of the best elementary school teachers I've ever met, certainly the best elementary school math teacher I've ever met. And I used to teach elementary school, so I have an idea what I'm looking for. Uh, she focused on things like uh, whether the kids were engaged, whether they were reasoning, whether they could um, try to dissect their own mistakes and figure out what they'd done wrong exactly what I want to see when I go into a classroom. She didn't worry about whether that was going to jack up scores at the end of the year. She wanted her kids to be able to think mathematically. That's good teaching. So what's gone wrong in a nutshell is that people have been forced to focus on scores rather than good teaching. Good teaching will raise scores, but not as fast as coaching will. I think what we're uh, talking about here, I mean, as teachers, we're concerned about our kids and grow. I mean, what's the purpose of education? We want them to grow up. We want them to be responsible, hardworking. We want them to have intelligence. We want them to be able to problem solve. Do we actually find out any of that good stuff when we give kids tests? Or, you know, what, what's, what's the solution here? Well, if the tests were used right, then the answer would be we learn a bit of that. So w if you go way back when to when I was in elementary school, the designers of some of the better standardized tests told teachers and administrators, this is specialized supplementary information. That's the phrase they used, supplementary. It adds to what you can learn by watching a classroom, for example, or by looking at students' own work. It's not a substitute for it. What's happened is that that whole logic of testing, which is a, that it's a, a way to add to what teachers know, is lost. And the policymakers say, no, the test scores tell us all of what we need to know. And that's just simply wrong. We don't know how to test many of the things that are important. So true. So true. So uh, we have this dilemma. And I think this is the reason that we ended up where we are right now. And the dilemma being that uh, a lot of money gets poured into the public school system. The people that are giving out this money, the, the taxpayers, the politicians, they want some sort of an accountability of where is this money going and are we actually getting the results that we want to pay for? So how do we get that kind of accountability right. for the money if we're not going to uh, do these high stakes tests? And I right. hope you can hear kind of some of the sarcasm in my voice. <laughs> I'm not telling you what I believe. but <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the advocates of, of high stakes testing had one thing right. When I was a teacher, uh, which I think was bef well before you started, there just wasn't any meaningful accountability. You know, if you weren't caught with an open bottle of scotch in your, in your room, you could pretty much do what you wanted once you were tenured. And I don't mean to be flip about it, but I had teachers in the schools where I taught who I thought shouldn't be teaching. Yeah. Um, and so they said, well, we really want some way to hold people accountable that's more meaningful than this sort of token evaluations that go on now. And I think they were right. It's just the method they chose doesn't work. You know, the things that will work are hard work. They're a, a lot costlier in time and money, and they're not so uh, simple and objective. I mean, I think you can't fully evaluate a school unless you go inside it and see what's happening in classrooms, for example. And the, the other side of this argument says, well, that's subjective. Well, it is subjective but it's one of the most important aspects of schooling. So you've got to you know, find the best way you can to do that. So I would st I say start with three things. I want to see um, good school climate. I want to see good practice on the part of teachers. I want to see the kinds of things that I saw Norca Padilla doing that I describe in my book. And I, and I want to see students learning, but learning isn't just test scores. It may be, for example, in high school showing that you can design and run a science experiment. But so those are the three I would start with. That's not the whole package. But if we're leaving out two of those three and part of the third, we're not getting a view of what school quality really is. I've often felt too um, that the, the kind of opportunities provided by a school tell a lot about the school's success. So you could have um, a school that doesn't provide many opportunities for students. It's just kind of like basic, get them through. And then you have other schools that are providing a lot of enrichment, art, music, like incredible types of activities and engagement for the kids. And that kind of says a lot about what experience and is gonna, the kids are going to have in their 
could we measure by just the opportunities provided by a school? Is that is that enough or not enough? Well, it certainly would help. And that actually gets to an interesting question, which is how do you evaluate those things? Mm -hmm. So the high school my kids went to, which is a very high achieving high school, had an absolutely spectacular music program. It was known throughout the state. The kids competed regionally in one competition after competition. It was very high status among the kids. Uh, they were competing for positions in the audition only um, parts of the program. Uh, so the question is, how would you evaluate that program? Could you do this with a standardized test, which a lot of states now try to do? And my answer is, well, I could probably figure out a test that would measure five or 10% of what the music director was doing. I could measure whether the kids were learning mu music theory, for example. That's about it. I couldn't measure the rest. Okay. Uh, you measure by watching how the kids were taught and by watching what they could produce. I mean, you go to their concerts and you realize these kids, 16 year old kids are playing serious music and doing it well. That's success. Right. So I think we do have to look at both what opportunities are offered and how well they're implemented. Very interesting. So, uh, boy, I think we've given our audience, uh, Dr. Koritz, a, a real good taste of your book. Is there anything that we're not asking you about that you find yourself to be very passionate about that you uh, uh, feel like people really need to hear about to, to draw them even more to your book so that they'll read that book and uh, learn more from you because it's it's just a fantastic resource. So what are we missing? <laughs> well, there are a number of things, but I'll pick one that's really close to my interests. Okay. One of the things I have to give the advocates of high stakes testing credit for is that many of them were motivate, motivated by a concern about equity. Uh, if you look at No Child Left Behind, for example, which is just an absolutely dreadful law, it was a train wreck waiting to happen, the motivation was in part good. There was, it wasn't an accident that you had liberals like George Miller in the House and Teddy Kennedy in the Senate supporting a Republican bill. They all thought this was finally going to start closing the gap between disadvantaged kids and others. And that's laudable, it just didn't work. And one of the things that's not obvious to people is how much that portion of the effort has failed. Because if you look at state test scores, you often see that the gap seems to have narrowed, sometimes really dramatically. And the research that's being done now shows that that closing of the gap is often just an illusion. What we're beginning to see, and I don't wanna, um, I shouldn't say beginning because the first evidence of this actually was published in the year 2000. So it's been, it's been accumulating for a while. What we're seeing is that inappropriate test prep is more common in the schools that serve disadvantaged kids and inflated test scores are more common. Well, let me phrase that differently. Score inflation is worse in disadvantaged schools. And so what we're getting is an illusion of improved equity. And so once again, even though it's in the name of improved equity, we're giving the kids who have the most difficult time the short end of the stick. Mm. Wow, so Listen, interesting, yeah, go I, ahead. I am so glad you wrote this book. Uh, I've loved reading it and I'm glad you, and I hope a lot of other people take off the gloves and don't hold any punches back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely for sure. All right, well, um, we're gonna, this is going to be a little bit briefer show today, but we're going to play a little game with you right now, if you don't mind. Uh, we usually do this with our guests. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> we're going to be trying to win a prize for one of our lucky listeners. Uh, and so the game that we're going to play with you today, of course, you've written a book called The Testing Charade. So we're going to play a little game with you. We're going to flip it around and we're kind of called The Charade's Testing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're going to be testing you on uh, your knowledge of the game of charades. <laughs> okay. Scott, why don't you tell our audience who Daniel will be comp competing for today? You're going to be competing for Lindsay Stewart, a third grade teacher in California. If you're able to answer two out of the three questions correctly, Lindsay is awarded a free download of an album by the ridiculously popular edgy rock band, Rockin' the Standards. All right. Well, Lindsay, I hope I don't mess it up for you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you'll do fine. So, Daniel, here we go with your first question. If a player in charades sweeps her or his arm through the air. This means which of the following? Is it A? Forget everything, start again. Is it B? <laughs> the entire concept. Or is it C? The last word of the phrase. I'm gonna go with A. Forget everything, that does make sense, but unfortunately, but it's, <laughs> uh, it's the entire concept. 
You know, you haven't given me any, any test prep. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> you need to do more tests. That's true. Very, very true. <laughs> you know these multiple choice tests. All right. Uh, this is, this is really not a high quality test. Either. No. <laughs> Let's be honest. It is, and we're not going to find out nearly what we need to know about you as a student. Uh, number two, to begin the game of charades, each team writes down phrases on little slips of paper. What is the maximum number of words allowed in each phrase? Is it A? Seven. Is it B? Nine. Or is it C? Twelve. I don't have a clue, but I'm going to guess A again. <laughs> hey, that's a good guess this time. <laughs> it, is, it is seven. That's right. The maximum number of words is seven that you can use in a phrase for charades. So according to the rules that I found, at least. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our last question here. If a player links his or her little fingers together, the pinkies, uh, this means which of the following? Is it A? The answer is plural. Is it B? The answer is a synonym of the last word stated. Wow, these are tough, Tim. I know, they're really hard. <laughs> I have no idea, you know, the answer. Uh, or is it C? The word is an abstract idea. It's got to be B. I, I take it not. <laughs> uh, you, you sure you don't want to try a different answer? I don't know if you call a friend or anything. Now, I have a case in the book where people used uh, M&Ms to give kids a clue when they got the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, Sorry, uh, <laughs> you might want to take one more stab at it, you know, well, you before give you give your more, final answer. Give it, if you give me two more steps, it's got to be correct. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so your choices are the answer is plural. The answer is a synonym of the last word stated, or the word is an abstract idea. I'll go with C. Abstract idea. Uh, uh, you mean A? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did I hear that correctly? Was that A, Scott? Is that what you heard? I this thought you said A. I, this is I when the kid leads over and quickly changes the answer on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> A is correct. How did you know? Yes, that's right. The answer we'll is We'll do some plural. editing. It'll be magic. <laughs> <laughs> you need an answer-changing okay. party after the... <laughs> <laughs> so that, was, that was absolutely perfect because here we are <laughs> testing someone who's an expert on testing, and we are just completely just blowing all the rules out of the water. <laughs> so, Scott, how, how did uh, Dr. Koritz do today? Good job. You got two out of three correct, and that's good enough to be a winner. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like an Atlanta style <laughs> test here, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've improved your scores dramatically as you learn. <laughs> <laughs> And that means uh, you've actually won nothing, but Lindsay, <laughs> she just won a free download of Rockin' the Standards, the education rock and roll music for second through sixth graders. Thank you so much for coming on the show and all of your effort to be here with us. I am so grateful, and yeah. I'm so grateful for your book, um, Tim. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Koritz. And where can our uh, audience learn more? Uh, I assume your book is on Amazon. Uh, do you have a website? Do you have I, a, a Twitter that you use or anything like that? Uh, or It's on Amazon. I do have a Twitter account, but mostly I am reading other people's tweets rather than doing my own. Right. Uh, but the book is available on Amazon. All right. That's where and, I bought it. <laughs> and do you have a, a website or anything that uh, talks about the book or no, actually, I don't. Okay. I, sh I should, but I actually don't. Well, that's that's perfectly fine. I'm sure Harvard has a website, right? Uh, they do. <laughs> uh, the uh, there are lots of um, uh, there are lots of uh, spinoffs of the book on the web, and Harvard has actually put out um, a, a Harvard and uh, the American Enterprise Institute have both posted video interviews in which we've gone into some depth in some of the content of the books. Um, but I don't have it on a website of mine. I really should do that. Maybe no, your but that's, question that's will be good. a prompt for me to actually get get off my rear end and do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we have a lot of projects that we're. <laughs> and this this is a must-read book, educators, uh, administrators. You need to get this in your hands and really be thinking about uh, your approach. And and uh, again, I thank you so much for being here and coming on the show today. Well, thanks very much for the chance to join you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Koritz, and. For our listeners, don't forget to sign up for Global School Play Day. You can go to globalschoolplayday.com, join the movement to bring unstructured play back into the lives of our young people. And we appreciate you watching and listening. And most of all, thanks for watching. Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad. <laughs>